Okay, good morning everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So before anything, I just want to briefly uh, touch upon next class. So next class will be the midterm. Uh, this is obviously being done over your courses. Uh, it's also worth noting that we won't have a lecture next class. So that's the next thing I need to stress. So remember this midterm, you'll have 50 minutes to complete it. And last day I said ten, it'll be open 10 minutes before and after. I buffed it up to 20 minutes before and after. So if you need me during any time during when you're taking this test, I'll be in my office hour Zoom room. So I've permitted you to use Zoom so that you can access and ask me questions or need clarifications. So just come to my office hour Zoom room. I will have the waiting room disabled so that you can come in and then uh, what I would like you to do, when you have a question, put it in the chat, but directly message me with it, okay? So that, that just hopefully that clarifies why. It's because uh, I don't want to have students having to wait for an answer to a question. And also at the same time, I don't want to disrupt anybody. So that way I can answer your question in the chat in the uh, this particular Zoom room. So just come to my office hour Zoom room, not the lecture. Zoom room, come to my office hours one if you have a question. You're not, you don't have to come here. Um, so I, what I'm saying is just pop it open if you have a question. Just come on by. You're not required to be there. Just this is if you need, if you have any questions you need to ask me. So if you're doing the test and you're like, oh, damn, I'm not sure how to answer this one. I'm not sure what he means here. Can you? Then it, you can open up Zoom and then you can uh, reach out to me there. Just put your question in the chat, direct it at me. Is that clear, everybody? So if you have a question or clarification, do that. If there's any tech issues like ProctorTrack or tech issues just generally, visit me here and I will provide you a URL in the chat there. And this will give, I'll give you a, a link that you can directly get support in a very timely fashion over Zoom with the tech people. So if you're having any of those issues, say for example, ProctorTrack, it keeps giving you issues because of some application and you can't close that application and so on and so on. This is when you reach out to me and I'll send you a link just in case you need it. Uh, likewise, uh, if you have not onboarded for the test, make sure that you do this at least eight hours before the test. So if you've done this already, that's great. But if you have not yet, I know there's a very small number of students that have not yet. Just remember, you got to make sure you do this at least eight hours before that. One other remark for students that have accommodations, I have by default set up so that uh, the test will open at the time I've just mentioned. So during class time, but before 20 minutes before, um, that's going to be open up for the accommodation students. And then there'll be that time permitted. Uh, so that time permitted starts at the same time everybody else has it, but it may extend and cut off after that time permitted. And I added a 20 minute after that. So if you have any issues or concerns, if you're an accommodation student, just reach out to me on a one-on-one -on -one level and I can see what we can do about things. Uh, like I said, you're going to need that time. Uh, so I know that, uh, I know that uh, you have to be careful with these things. I must stress that you won't need a calculator for this test. Uh, and it's not permitted to use a calculator. And I must stress also that, uh, that when you're answering the questions, the written parts, I recommend using keystrokes to type in your answers because you only will have so much time. I don't want you wasting a lot of time having to make it look all pretty. But remember, you gotta make sure you communicate your answers clearly to me. But if you find yourself really needing access to the equation editor, I have made sure it's available. I've confirmed this with the tech people. If you ever wanna look for it, uh, on the toolbar for your, uh, for the, for the, on the toolbar uh, within your text field box for the essay based questions, uh, you'll be able to find a little calculator icon. That's where your equation editor is. If you're looking for that, you can get special symbols as well, like the left arrow. But if you find yourself wanting to use say less than and a dash like this, that's okay. Or you want to use colon and equals for assignment, that's also okay. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, I'm hoping everything will go nice and smoothly next day. I think that uh, if you understand the material carefully and you think about the data structures in a way that we've thought about them during class time and you feel very cozy with things, I think everybody will do fine. So are there any questions about the midterm and preparation for this for next day? So remember, next day we won't have a lecture. Instead, you'll be doing this test. And if you want to pop by, if you have questions or clarifications, just come by my office, our Zoom room, and I will address your question in the chat. So just direct it at me. 
directly. <laughs> Are we all good? Does that sound great? I've seen some lovely pictures, by the way, in the mock test. I really appreciate it. I really liked your question. Uh, sorry, your, your pictures. But yeah, if you haven't done that one yet, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, it's a nice way to... That's strange. There's a cat in front of me. Let me get this cat here. Hey, here's the cat. <laughs> so here's the cat. I was meowing. <laughs> yeah, this is Mochi, by the way. Everybody say hi to Mochi. Think of the snack. There's Mochi. Bye, Mochi. <laughs> um, but no, the um, a question. Uh, can we keep a blank page in the worst case we need? Oh, yes. One thing I need to stress, uh, you are encouraged to have a, piece of a couple pieces of scrap paper off to the side uh, when you're working through these problems because you will very much need it. Uh, for some of this stuff, just to fiddle around with the ideas that you're playing around with. Yeah, you're permitted to have scrap paper beside you, just not a cheat sheet, okay? No cheat sheets. But you'll, you'll be allowed to have a scrap piece of paper or scrap pieces of paper uh, while you're doing the test. Uh, likewise, I believe I've also enabled it, so if you need something kind of like that, but uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I'd have to confirm it, but I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but that's really all I have to say about the midterm. Thank you for bringing that up, by the way. Yes, you will be obviously allowed to use scrap paper as much as you like. Um, and as I mentioned uh, the other day, it's also in the format. Uh, you will have the option to upload files for the written questions other than the drawing picture one. Uh, but I word to the wind, you want to make sure you use that time because I'm not going to permit you any extra time afterwards or anything after the fact. So whatever you submit to me during that time period, that's your submission for the test. Just to be clear. So that's mostly there for accessibility reasons in case there's anybody that has difficulties typing answers. But if you need it, you're welcome to use it. Yes, you're welcome to move back and forth between the questions in any order. Yes. Yes, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, it should, on the right side, it should allow you to uh, pick between the pages, the pages or questions. Uh, are there any example given in the notes where I can practice from? Remember, I gave, you the, I gave you a format. So the format actually tells you exactly what I'm going to ask you. Uh, so, so you just take a look at the format announcement. That will tell you exactly what you should expect walking into this thing. So I don't want you to walk into this thing thinking, oh, I have no idea what I'm walking into. Uh, so there's going to be some concept-based questions at the beginning, uh, some that are going to apply your knowledge. Um, these written ones, they're a combination of concepts where I'm going to ask you just to elaborate on something, or they may be applying your knowledge. But, uh, but take a look at that format announcement. I go into a great deal of detail there. But yeah, that's the main trade-off, is I usually like to give you... Uh, so let's see, so if we don't type the answer, but we may we write the whole solution on a piece of paper, that can be counted as an answer if we up, yeah, 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 that's what I'm saying, is you're welcome to uh, upload your answer. Uh, and so I made it so that there is a file submission upload, so if you, but the caution to the wind is I'm not giving you any extra time to do this. So that 50 minutes, that as soon as it starts, that's all the time you have. So that's why I'm saying you should be able to just type all of your answers in the box. Uh, that's what I'm recommending you do because you're probably going to need that time. I usually design my tests so they don't take the full amount of time. Uh, but I just want to make sure that you don't find yourself in a predicament where you write out your answer on a piece of paper and then you're finding yourself, oh, I need time to scan it or I need to take a picture or something. And I find that, and you have some technical issue in between there. I don't want that to happen to you. But like I said, that's, your, that's a risk you're willing to take, uh, you can do that. So just make sure you have all that set up before you take the test if you're going to do it that way. And that's okay, that's okay. Okay, so if there aren't any other questions, uh, I wanna wish you the best of luck for Friday. Uh, if you have any other questions, just reach out to me by email, I'm very happy to answer them. And remember, I cannot answer, I'm not going to be able to answer, like, is this on the test? Look at the format announcement. I tell you what I'm going to expect from you there and what I will not expect you to know for this test or what I'm not going to examine you on. 
So I've given you some leeway on what you exactly should expect. If you're wondering about that algorithm design problem, it will expect you to be able to apply a given data structure to solve some problem. I know that some people have asked me about this. It's like, yeah, I'll just give you some data structure, likely the one I mentioned in the format, and ask you to solve some problem. I'll give you a hint to help you work through it. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So, so if we're all good, give me a thumbs up, by the way. Are we all good with that? Give me a thumbs up. Wonderful, wonderful. I just want to make sure. I, I think I'm hoping that everybody will be doing great on this test. Um, I'm not here to punish you or anything like that. I'm here to make sure and under, that you understand what we are doing in this course. So I want to examine that understanding. So when you walk out of that test, my goal is to make sure that you walk out of that, you'll feel confident about your understanding of the material that we've been looking at. Okay, so if we're all good with that, I'm gonna to proceed to where we were last day. So last day, we were talking about how we can represent graphs on computers. So in particular, how we can represent data structures for graphs. So last day I had shown you the adjacency matrix, which I told you was very nice for representing dense graphs. So that's where I have many, many edges. Uh, it's also quite good for small graphs as well. So remember that's just a two dimensional array. It's a nice and simple way of implementing a graph. It's very natural. And users, there's a nice natural OO way of interpreting it too. So you can add actually references or pointers to edge objects. If you wanna have an edge object or a vertex object, you're welcome to have that. It's very flexible. Uh, here's another one, and I would argue that this one's even more flexible in many regards, but uh, let me talk about this. Uh, it's what is called an adjacency list. So this is the second of the two I'm going to show you here. There's, these are not the only ones. Uh, there's other ones that exist, such as an, an incidence matrix. Uh, that's where you look at the incidence between the instance relations between two edges. Uh, that's another representation that does exist. There's also exists something called an edge list. But uh, adjacency list, it's very natural. So what I do is I look at the incidence sequence for each vertex V. So that sounds like a lot of jargon at first when you read this, then you think, okay, well, what does he mean by that? Well, remember when we talked about a vertex and I said, oh, I have all the edges that are incident on a given vertex. I would like a nice natural way of representing this. So we call this a so-called thing an adjacency list. And classically, the way we implement these is using a vertex indexed array where each element is a length list. So it will look something like this I have over here on the right. So what I mean by this is, so for example, here's the same graph I had from last day. So just take all the subscripts I have here and those are how I'm going to index into this, uh, this data structure over on the right. So for example, if I look at vertex zero, notice that the only edge I have incident on V zero or vertex zero is in fact vertex four. So notice that I can store the other endpoint in a node and then I can have a linked list just like you would think of naturally with just the linked list. So I just list out all of the other endpoints which would form incident edges on vertex, in our case, V zero. Likewise, if I look at say vertex three, notice over there, I have three incident edges, each one on V3. So I have vertex one, vertex two, and vertex four are all of the edges, the, oh, sorry, the other endpoints to those edges. So that's why we call it an adjacency list is because I store the adjacencies of all of my neighbors for a given vertex. So for example, just one more time. So if I look at vertex four, notice that I have two neighbors, V0 and V3. Those are two vertices I'm adjacent to from my perspective as V4. So notice I have zero and three right here for V0 and V3. This is quite natural. So you just have a, a, an array of linked lists. So naturally you could just think of this as some collection as well. So another way you can interpret this more as a much more generalized OO based structure is you can imagine it having a primary data structure that stores references or pointers 
to vertex objects. And then each one of the vertices stores a collection of incident edges, where each one of these is an edge object. So you have a primary list structure, and then you have, for each one, a secondary list structure. So both of these are list data structures. So for example, you can make this, like I said, an array if you wanted to. You could make it, for example, uh, like a hash table if you really wanted to. Uh, you could do all sorts of fun things with this. Um, so you can switch and swap all the data structures you'd like for the sec primary part and the secondary part. But classically, I usually like to work with this one. That's at least the one I prefer, but this is a much more generalized structure. So you can see how I can swap different data structures to use this. So if you want to say, for example, have a graph and you don't want to necessarily have it where you have to index them all like this, you may have some hash function that allows you to access the references for each one. But I want to focus primarily on this one over here. One remark I do want to make is that this isn't necessarily the only information you can store in each one of the nodes. You don't have to just only store the other endpoint of the edges that are incident on that vertex. What you can always do is you can always store other information. So for example, you can always have a reference to an edge object. So, and then that edge object, you can also store some more information if you need it. So you can put more information inside of these nodes, and that's very often what we're going to be doing when we proceed a little further on. So some of the graph algorithms I'll be using, uh, I'll be doing things such as this. Uh, so we'll be focusing primarily on this, but I just want to make sure you are aware that there do exist ways to generalize the linked list structure. So does everybody have an idea of how this works? So just remember, all I have to do is if I want to know all of the edges, all of the edges that are incident on a given vertex, or I want to know all of the vertices adjacent on a given vertex, I just index into my array, and then I just follow the linked list. Ah, so that's a wonderful question. So when linking them, how do you decide the order to link them? The great part about this is it doesn't matter. Uh, so that's the great part. So notice that if I go here and I want to have it okay, well, say for example, actually let's go over here. I must stress that all I really care about, so I will be talking about operations that you can apply to these adjacency lists. Uh, say for example, I look at vertex three. It doesn't matter if that vertex one comes first. It could have been vertex four right here and I could have had them in any order. So some people like to maintain a certain ordering for the vertices. Uh, some don't. Generally, you don't have to maintain any ordering on these. That's a wonderful question, by the way. I like that question. So, but yeah, no, it, it, it's great because you don't, all you have to do is just, you just think of each one of these as a linked list. And then as soon as you know that, oh yeah, no, it's just a linked list. And so I just play around with it just like you would there. You just like inserting at the front of a linked list. That's a very simple way of inserting edges into a graph, for example, with the adjacency list representation. One other remark, uh, obviously if the graph is directed, that means that you don't necessarily need to have it where, because notice that if I look at, say, edge, uh, let's look at edge, edge A. So I labeled it A here. Notice that I have two endpoints, V0 and V4. If I look in V0, notice that if I follow along this list, Notice there's four right here. That's one of the endpoints. That's the endpoint for the edge A, where the other one was zero, right? So, because zero is adjacent to four. But if I look at list four, you also will find that zero is sitting right here as well, which is what you should expect because it's an undirected graph. If it's a directed graph, when you have U from U to V, that means that all you're going to have is you're going to have V sitting in the adjacency list of U. So it would only appear in one of the two lists. So you can use this for all sorts of different structures. In fact, if you want to have many, many edges, like multi-edges, you can just, it, it doesn't change any of the principles here. Excellent. So I want to talk about some properties of adjacency lists. I'm going to particularly focus on the classic implementation. This is the one that I want to focus on. So if anybody asks you, oh, look, how do I implement an adjacency list? This is the one I'm, this is the one that they're probably going to talk about with you. 
This this other one is a far more this uh, this OO based one I have over here. Although you can make this other one OO based. Uh, this one's far more general. I just want to give you a flavor for what you can do with an adjacency list. So here's some properties that adjacency lists do have. Is that naturally, if you want to check if two, if I want to see if there's an edge in a graph, all I have to do. So if I want to know if one vertex is adjacent to another vertex, all I do is I just I take one of the endpoints and I just simply say, hey, look, say, for example, I want to know where that that edge uh, vertex zero to vertex four or the edge v0, v4 exists. I just can traverse down one of the lists, say I can index into this one and I can just traverse the list. And I or I can go down the other one, say if I look on four, c zero is right there. So notice that you might ask, Dan, how long are these lists? <laughs> well, here's the interesting part about the length of these lists. They depend on the degree of a vertex. So they based on the degree. So recall the degree is the number of incident edges on a given vertex. So for example, notice that the degree of vertex three, if you recall back to the example, the degree of vertex three was in fact three. So notice there are exactly three nodes in my list here. So that means that all you have to do is you just traverse down one of the lists. You can either pick U or V and you just traverse down it. And if you find it, that means they're adjacent. It's nice and simple. If you want to get all the incident edges, unlike an adjacency matrix, remember in the adjacency matrix, I had to traverse across all the columns of a given row or all the rows of a given column, depending on which way you want to interpret it. If we're doing an undirected graph, it doesn't matter. A directed graph, it does. You just care about if you scan across the columns in that case for a given row. Um, so in here, it's really simple. All you do is you just read off the linked list. That's all you have to do. So you just traverse one of the lists and that tells you, oh, those are all the incident edges. So if you ever ask, if ever I ask you, okay, how do we compute all the incident edges of a given vertex? You just scan the link list. That's all you have to do. So just to, it's dependent on the degree of that vertex. Now, if you want to insert an edge, you can do it in constant time. All you do is you just insert it at the front of the link list for that given vertex. So that's all you have to do. So if it was a directed graph, you would have to insert it just at the front of one of the lists. If you do it with an undirected graph, you would just do two insertions, one at the front of V's list and then another one on U's list. So you might ask, Dan, why do you say it takes constant time if that's the case? It's because if you don't care about there being multi edges in your graph, it really doesn't matter then because all you have to do is you just cram it in there. You just put it at the front of the link list. You never check for duplicates. However, if you require that that graph is a simple graph, you have to make sure that there aren't self loops or multi edges. So that means that you can't necessarily just do that. You have to scan the whole list to just make sure there isn't that edge already in the graph already. Does everybody understand that? So I could just insert at the front of the link list, just like I would with any link list. I just put the node, sorry, the information of the other endpoint in one of the nodes, just put that at the front of the link list. It's very nice and simple. But if I care about the uniqueness of that vertex, then I can't simply do that. I have to scan the whole list. So if I don't care about multiplicities, meaning I don't care about multi edges, then I could just do this in constant time. Otherwise, you have to be a bit more careful. For our purposes, this is all we need. Uh, for removing an edge, however, you have to go now. Now, you have to be a bit careful when you're removing. Notice that because if I give you an undirected graph, you might scan one of the lists. Um, and then you say, OK, well, I want to remove, say, vertex two. If I try to remove vertex two from this graph, notice that I'm going to have to be very careful about this because, sorry, not vertex two, sorry. If I remove an edge, say for example, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, if I remove edge, say if I try removing edge, say I want to remove edge four zero. So V zero, V four. What I would need to do is I would need to scan this list, remove this node from the linked list, 
And in this one down here, this is, the, remember, this is the other list for the other endpoint. I would have to scan this list and remove the one for zero because I have to keep all my bookkeeping in place. Does everybody see that? So I have to scan two linked lists. So I have to remove the node for one of the endpoints, and then I have to scan the other linked list to get rid of the other endpoint. And since I know what the edge is, I, have, I know exactly which lists I should be traversing down. Now, like I said, it depends on how long these lists are. So that means that you're going to have to take the degree of U plus the degree of V. Those are the lengths of both of those lists in the worst case. So naturally, you might ask, OK, well, how do you do insertions and removals of vertices? I'm going to I have a bit more details in the notes, but I'm just going to orally say it. So when you do an insertion with this implementation, remember, this is just an array that stores pointers or references to nodes that contain information, right? And I index a vertex by a number. So whenever I want to insert a vertex, I assign it a new number that will use the index into this array. And then I can then insert edges just like I did before, right? However, if I remove a vertex, if I try to remove a vertex, you have to be a bit more careful. Actually, sorry. Let me make one point, one point about that. Did anybody notice something interesting about if I do an insertion? This comes back to something I talked about earlier on in the course. If the array, for example, is full, what do I have to do? <laughs> what do I have to do if that array that stores all those pointers, what happens if that array becomes full? And I, yeah, you have to copy all of those, those pointers to a new array that's resized. Like you might double the length of the array. Exactly, exactly. Everybody's getting it. Wonderful. So I'll have to make a new array. Then I have to copy over all of the pointers, right? So you notice that, that it means that this is going to take, in the worst case, linear time, right? Linear in the number of nodes. Well, linear, sorry, I should be a bit more precise. Linear in the number of vertices in the graph. So notice that that is the case. And if you're wondering, OK, well, what does this look like when I look at it from an amortized standpoint? Well, you can actually use the exact same analysis I gave you actually earlier in the course to prove that the amortized running time of the insertion actually is constant. So, so if you're wondering about insertions, you can do it. It takes linear time in the worst case. It's constant time amortized. Removals, however, that is a much trickier business because you have to do a lot more bookkeeping. If I remove a vertex, notice that if I try removing one, like any one of these, I may have to update and clean up the entire graph. Why? Because I may have to scan through a whole bunch of these lists. I have to go through all of these and just make sure I don't run into that vertex. If I do, then I better remove the edge that's, that, uh, that it's, uh, that's incident on it. And likewise, yeah, I may want to clean up this array here, so I may have to shuffle a whole bunch of entries across. So, so it involves cleanup. So there's a lot of cleanup there, but it does take linear time with respect to the number of edges and the number of vertices in the graph. But yeah, no, so that's all I have to say really about these aspects of the adjacency list. I want to point out one very important property about adjacency lists. So let me move back on over where I'm over here. So I want to talk briefly about something that is something that you really should consider when you think about a data structure, is indeed how much space it uses. So remember, with an adjacency matrix, we require space that is quadratic in the number of vertices, right? So we have to be a bit careful about this. So we want to talk briefly about, I'm going to briefly talk about space usage for our adjacency list. So now I want you to notice something. This is, this is, this is a very interesting hindsight. This is why it's important to be aware of structures when you're studying or you're applying them. So in this case, a graph. So notice that we have a list 
for each vertex. Right? That's indeed something we have. And for each, and for each vertex in the set of vertices, there is a, a list with degree of V nodes. Right? That's what we established earlier. So you might ask, how much is the total space I use for my data structure? Obviously, I'm assuming that these nodes, other than what I have, these nodes themselves store some constant amount of space if I ever I augment them. So, or there's just something that cancels out asymptotically. Um, now, I want you to notice, if I look at each one of my, my lists here, so I'm going to obviously have this array. It's going to, there's going to be n entries here, right? Then I'm going to have each one of the lists. But each one of the lists is, in fact, the, the number of nodes is, is based on the degree of that vertex, right? So there's a wonderful theorem that we had and we used the other day. It's called the handshaking lemma. So, so by the handshaking lemma, let's use the handshaking lemma because it tells us what the sum of the degrees are over all the vertices, right? By the handshaking lemma, we know the sum, sum of the degrees is equal to 2m. So an adjacency list uses big O of n plus m space. Does everybody see that? So for all of what I have here on the right side, all of this, I require big O of m space. Then I have my array that's going to store all these pointers. We know that's going to be big O of n. So I'm just taking these and I'm slamming those together. Does everybody see that? So this is an interesting application of the handshaking lemma. So notice that, so one thing I want to point out about this is notice that, that isn't quadratic, but it also depends on the number of edges. <laughs> so you'll notice that if the number of edges is the most possible, for example, for a simple graph, you're going to end up with quadratic space anyways. But notice that if the graph does not have many edges, this is actually quite good, right? For example, if, uh, so if, if m is big O of n, the operations and space usage is quite efficient, if you actually think about it, right? It's quite efficient. Because now it's linear in the number of vertices in the graph. Now. I want to ask and really, I want to want to point out one thing. So I'm getting really excited about showing you this. Um, there are many types of graphs out there that actually have this property, that the number of edges is in fact, it is big O of the number of vertices. There actually are many kinds of graphs that actually have this property. You might think of some. Uh, for example, one that you've seen before, trees. Uh, so I'm going to say some graphs. have this property. So some graphs have this property. So for example, trees do. So anytime you encounter a tree, this might be an effective data structure to use to represent your graph. Um, trees, forests. So remember we talked about forests last day. Ah, uh, here's, let me throw another one. There's a many different graphs classes that you could talk about. But one I want to point out is something called a planar graph. I'm not sure if you've heard of a planar graph before, but let me draw you a fun picture. So say, for example, I have this graph here. Now, if you look carefully at this picture, this graph I have here, 
you might notice it's actually K4. I didn't draw it this way last day, but that's K4. Notice that every vertex is adjacent to every other vertex, and there are four vertices. So that's K4. So that's the complete graph on four vertices. Now, you'll notice that the way I drew it, notice that I have it where I have two edges crossing. Now in a general graph, that doesn't make any difference whatsoever. But sometimes there's a special meaning that the graph may have. So sometimes we call where they cross, we call that a crossing. So for example, right, right there. So for example, I have a crossing right there. Now, believe it or not, I can take K4 and I can draw it so that there aren't any crossings in the graph. So this is the picture I showed you last day about K4. So this is also K4, but notice there's no crossings. So there are different graphs that actually have the property that you can draw them in the plane. So I mean on like a piece of paper so that there aren't any crossings between the edges. So those are what we call planar graphs. So many kinds of graphs actually fit this category uh, in applications. For example, if you're dealing with very basic route information, say for example, I just wanna go from A to B, so many cases, it may actually be that there's some way of actually taking that graph and representing it so that it has no edge crossings. So a basic example, say if you have a map of a city, the only time you're ever gonna have edges that cross would be if you had an on-ramp or something, but there's gonna be cases where that may not actually ever happen. Uh, so you're gonna have it where maybe you have, an, you have some, you have some in, say you have a model of where the, the uh, intersections or vertices in the graph, you may have it where the edges are going to be the streets that connect those intersections. Uh, this is, happens very many, many times in applications. So in routing, for example, uh, you may have it where you end up actually with a planar graph. So it means that, there, that th this representation may be a very effective one. And like I said, you could generalize it further if say if you really need to have some structure that may not necessarily fit in memory, for example. But my point is, is just that these, there's many kinds of graph classes out there. Planar graphs, these are just simply ones for which there exists a drawing of that graph in the plane so that there's no crossing. Another way you could think about it is I have a piece of paper and I wanna draw it on the piece of paper such that my pen, I never lift my pen, but I never cross any of my lines that I drew. Lines or curves, in fact, you can even go up the curves if you want. My point is, is that there are some graphs that this is a very effective representation. So are there any questions about this? So that's all I have to say about representing graphs is that we have adjacency matrices and we have adjacency lists. And, uh, but yeah, no, so that's an adjacency list. And hopefully this gives you some idea of like there's costs and benefits to picking each one. So this one, for example, is very good. And we often refer to these kind of graphs as sparse. So remember, I told you last day that sparse, let me just rewrite that. that. That looks a little too melted in the microwave as far as I'm concerned. So these are graphs, of course, where the number of edges is big O of N, where N is the number of vertices. So sparse graphs, adjacency lists are no question going to be much better than adjacency matrix. But yeah, no, so you'll find when I'm doing the algorithm analysis, I'll pick up each one of these representations and I'll do the analysis with it. Okay, so if there are any other questions, I'm going to proceed to talking about our next topic in relation to graph algorithms. So let me just move on on over here. Okay, so next I wanna talk about graph traversals. Now in the past, you may or may not have seen tree traversals. These are things such as like post order, pre order, in order traversals. You can do the same kind of thing with a graph. So I'm gonna talk about graph traversals and I'll probably talk about this for the next couple of lectures. Because these are fundamental for how we design algorithms on graphs. 
So what's a graph traversal? It's quite simple. You just process. It's a process of starting, starting at a vertex, vertex U in V, and processing all the vertices, all the vertices and edges. And here comes the fun word, the vertices and edges reachable, reachable from you. Okay, so you might ask what the heck does reachable mean? So let me do an example with you. So we have, say that's A, we have H, we have B, C, E, D, and then the bottom two are going to be F and G. Okay. So, say for example, if I make vertex U be A, so notice that there exists a path from U to every other vertex in this graph. Likewise, I can traverse over any one edge in this graph. Does so everybody see that? So this is what I mean by reachable. Now in contrast, if say for example, I threw another edge, sorry, I've run the vertex out here. Say I call it vertex I. Is I reachable from you? Somebody answer me. Can I, so the easy way you can think of it, yeah, exactly. No, I can't reach it. It's not reachable from you. Because notice there is no path that gets me from you to I. So if you know the graph is connected, for example, you know every vertex is reachable from you. So this would mean that there exists at least two connected components in the graph. So notice that this is one connected component, this is the other connected component. So that's th this is what I mean by reachable. So however, if I selected this to be you, I could say that I is reachable from you because I am you. Um, not literally, not literally. Um, however, I could say that you, that uh, definitely D isn't reachable from you, G isn't, E isn't, F isn't, B isn't, C isn't, A isn't, and H isn't. Hey, no, no worries. Yeah, no, this is very natural when you talk about networks as well. That's why I like to show graphs like these because they pop up all over the place. So as soon as you start seeing this stuff, it, this is something, a very powerful tool at the computer scientist toolbox for modeling things. Networks are a very natural extension of a lot of the theory I'm talking about here. So, so now let, let me talk about one small thing, one small thing before I proceed. I'm going to make two assumptions here. And this is dependent on your data structure. I'm going to assume that vertices in my graph can be marked and unmarked in constant time. So that's the first assumption I'm going to make. This is an easy one to implement into a graph. Uh, what you do is you have either, so if you want to take a much more bare bones approach, say for example, you have your adjacency list, what you could do is you could store another array and that other array could store this information, whether it's marked or not marked using bits that you flip. Like you could turn on, make it one when you mark it, zero when you don't mark it. Another way you could do this is you could just simply have vertex objects that you could keep track of as part of the edge objects. That's another way you could do this. Um, 
Uh, or you could, like I said, you can have vertex objects in its own list as well. There's many ways you can approach this. Another assumption that I'm going to make is that edges can be labeled. Now you might ask, what the heck does marking mean? I just simply mean that I'm putting a little tick saying, hey, look, I visited this one or I didn't visit this one. That's how I'm going to use it. Edges can be labeled in constant time. So this one is very natural. If you think about it, like I said before, all I have to do is store a pointer or a reference to an edge object and I can use that edge object to access its label. So for example, there might be some edge object sitting out here in memory for vertex four. Then I have some pointer here and I say, oh, okay, there's the edge object there. Here's the edge object here. And then I can access its label as one of the attributes in that graph. So this would be something that you do as you build the graph. So you can have both of these assumptions in play for what we're doing. But I wanna give you an idea of how we can traverse a graph. So I'm gonna show you the idea of how we do this, the last bit of the time we have here for class, and then we'll go into the analysis next day. So the first kind of graph traversal I'm gonna show you is called depth first search. And the name gives you a good idea of what we're going to do with this. So I'll be going into more detail about depth first search next day, but I wanna give you a motivation, an idea of how we're going to go about this. So we're gonna talk about depth first search. So depth first search. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to think of the graph like a maze. Where, where vertices are intersections, are intersections or dead ends. Imagine this is like some, some great maze that's like in a video game or something. Uh, so you can have dead ends in the pathways in your big maze, or you can have intersections where you might find multiple pathways. Um, and then I can say edges are passages. connecting the vertices, which I've established are intersections or dead ends. Sorry, this should be dead edge. For some reason I wrote dead edge, this is dead end. My apologies. Okay, so I got one minute, I just wanna motivate this for you and I'll come back to this next day. So has anybody heard of the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur? So it's a classic Greek myth. There's many, there's at least a couple different ways you can interpret this myth. So just in the purpose of our story, let me come back to my picture I have over here. So in the story, uh, Theseus from Athens, uh, he finds himself on a quest to slay the beast known as the Minotaur. So there's this king named King Minos of Crete in the story, and has a daughter named Ariadne. And in the story, Ariadne gives Theseus a ball of thread. And what Theseus is instructed to do by Ariadne with this thread is to explore the labyrinth, which is this very, very complicated structure developed by this great inventor named Daedalus, where Daedalus made this maze so complicated that nobody can find their way out of this thing. However, there is a beast in this labyrinth named the Minotaur. So this is in a half man, half bull. And you might ask, where did this half man, half bull come from? Uh, well, I'll just give you one interpretation of how it goes about. There's some tussle that, or conflict that King Minos, that remember the king of Crete, was having. And he begs for this, this, uh, this way from Poseidon, the Greek god of the seas. And Poseidon offers a white bull to King Minos. And what happens is King Minos says, this bull is very beautiful. It's a white bull, uh, quite an interesting thing to see. And King Minos says, hey, look, I'm gonna keep this bull 
I'll sacrifice something else, but Poseidon actually wanted King Minos to sacrifice the white bull. So Poseidon, in classic Greek mythology fashion, puts, kind of dis causes King Minos' wife to get into a very deep, deep, infatuated relationship with the bull that King Minos did not sacrifice, and stuff happened. <laughs> And I'm just, I'm not going to go into all the specifics, but I'm just going to say that there's some interpretations where King Minos's wife climbs into a woodcrafted cow. She climbs into it and does the thing with the bull. Um, I, like I said, I, I'm not going into all the details with this any further. You can find art of these things on pottery. Um, but uh, my point is, is that in the story, this is Minotaur and Theseus is looking for it. So imagine Theseus enters into the labyrinth, this great maze, say right here. So Ariadne tells, tells Theseus to use the spool of thread to help explore the labyrinth so that Theseus keeps the thread at the entrance so that Theseus cannot get lost in this maze because this maze is so complicated that nobody, everybody doesn't get out of this thing. So. And the, and the Minotaur eats them, by the way, <laughs> that we don't want that to happen. So naturally, Theseus will use the thread to allow to follow through the maze all the way until the maze has been explored or Theseus finds the Minotaur. So the way Theseus does this is quite natural. Theseus will mark vertices where every time Theseus encounters an intersection or a dead end. This is both the equivalent of putting this thread out and as I go across an edge, I'm gonna lay that thread across. This is what we're gonna be doing with depth for search. So I'm gonna go back to this next day. So I apologize for taking an extra minute of your time. When I come back next week, because remember, best of wishes with the midterm, we'll talk more about depth for search, okay? So I say thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you later.